Oh my God, I get to talk to you about video games after all these amazing talks. So typically the questions I get are, where can I get a Nintendo Switch because they're completely sold out? Why the hell are my kids playing so much Minecraft? And did you really wear your hair like that in the 1980s? <laughs> right? And you can't get a Switch if you didn't order it. Minecraft, it's amazing. Go play with your kids. And anybody that grew up in the 80s, you all wore your hair like that. Stop it. Own it. The 80s were the best, right? <laughs> all right. But we're not going to talk about those questions. I'm here today to talk to you about why I believe video games are one of the most important and transformative art forms that humanity has ever had at their disposal and why it's the perfect environment through which to ask these very difficult questions and find answers within ourselves, all right? So first, some history. This is me growing up. Uh, this is kind of my life in video games. Uh, the picture up here on your top left is what happens when you have a sibling with maybe a vendetta, a scanner, and Facebook, and starts posting pictures of you when you were 10. Uh, kind of goofy-eyed all the way to my 40th birthday cake that was adorned with a giant Atari logo. My wife going, really? Seriously? That's what you want to do? Um, and then, of course, me leaping. Somehow I'm always smiling, screaming, or leaping in any one of these things um, at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, which opened in March of 2012. Um, it was a 6,000-square-foot installation at the American Art Museum in D.C. Almost 700,000 people came through this exhibition. It traveled for three and a half years through 10 additional venues around the country, espousing the virtues of video games and demonstrating their impact as an art form on American culture. And yes, most of the machines in the exhibition were from my personal collection, and my wife was happy to have them out, and now they're all back home, and it's driving everyone nuts. Okay. So when I was growing up, I was part of a generation I called the Bit Baby generation. We were the first kids that grew up with computers in the home. And this is where most people experienced computers for the first time. This is the early arcades in the early, late 1970s and 1980s. And inside of the arcade, people could um, come together, and there was kind of this unspoken social contract. You would have men who didn't know each other standing almost shoulder to shoulder playing games for a long period of time. You put your quarters up on the marquee, and there was an honor system that you didn't touch them. And again, this is where people first experienced video games and awesome hair. Right, and computers and awesome hair. This is the very first computer I started programming on. This is the, called the Commodore VIC-20. It is a computer with five kilobytes of RAM. <laughs> to put that in perspective for you all, the icon you click to get online using Chrome is 18 times larger than all of the memory we had to create the very first games. And they were beautiful. These games, in a word, empowerment. It was giving power to the powerless. If I was a kid at that time, which I was at that time, if I could dedicate myself to understanding how the computer spoke, if I could understand how to speak to it, I could type into existence the worlds this, that I wanted to create, the stories that I wanted to tell. It is literally power to the powerless. And it felt kind of like cave painting, right? The earliest form of, kind of recorded expression that mankind had. And these cave paintings from the early 1980s required additional art to describe the breadth of experience, the intent, the design ideas that these artists had and wanted to impart to the world. Now, Missile Command, which is a very, it seems to be a very benign combat game or shooting game, is actually a statement on the futility of nuclear war. And the man who actually created this game suffered from night terror for almost three years because he internalized this futility to such a, a degree that it affected him. He saw what was happening in the world around him. He made a statement about it, and he suffered for it. It's no different than any other artist that purports to bring art to the world. And the earliest artist felt exactly the same way. This is actually ad copy from 1982. This is Electronic Arts' very first print ad where they talk about computers meaning something more, that through computers they were able to express their humanity, their ideas, to a willing world. And again, as we look at other forms of expression that have been at our disposal, from cave paintings, the earliest forms of film, the first recorded Sumerian writings, right, which were the first written account of our ancestry, to the very first composition of music that were saved in these scrolls, Time, technology, refinement, communication allows us now to tell the full breadth of humanity and experience through these mediums. And we can address topics such as, you know, ex machina, which talks about the fear of AI and what it truly means to be human. 
But we're kind of just getting out of the cave with regard to video games. Those other forms of art have had hundreds, if not thousands of years to refine themselves, to find the tools and be able to speak these stories and present them to a willing world. So if we're still kind of just getting out of that age, we're only 45 years young when it comes to games, how could it possibly be used to express the breadth and complexity of human emotion and story? So let's take a journey, shall we? Right, we're gonna do that? Here we go, all right, Pac-Man, all right? So the goal of Pac-Man is to what? Save your own butt, right? You save your butt, you eat the dots, you grab the power pellets, you kill the ghost monsters, or actually monsters, by the way, for game historians there, and get yourself out of the maze. Or games like Donkey Kong, right? Which was the first video game, or one of the very first, that actually had a full narrative arc. Pauline gets captured by Donkey Kong, you as Jumpman, not Mario, kids, um, ascend through these different levels, and you're reunited with her. Or games like the Oregon Trail, right? <laughs> Save your family, right? And hope we don't die of what? Dysentery, of course, right? <laughs> or games like Super Mario, the Super Mario series, where we need to save the seven mushroom kingdoms and, uh, from Bowser and, and, and his couplings. Or game series like Final Fantasy that allow us to save the world. Now, even in these very, again, rudimentary or simpler forms of games, we see artists and, and storytellers trying to impart some more adult themes. Uh, in a game like Final Fantasy III, they actually deal with uh, suicide, right? But again, in very simplistic forms, they're still trying to kind of craft their way forward and figure out how to use this medium to better tell the stories they want to tell. All right, so let's not go save the world, save the town, save your family, save the girl, or save your own butt. How about in this game where we're just going to help this little girl save her cat? Lost her cat, and she has to go save it. And that's your role, is you have to guide her in the world to save her cat. Except this girl is blind. And the world that you see on the screen is presented to you through her mind, through the sounds and touch of the world around her. It, she is painting for you what she sees. Or games like Life is Strange. Has anyone ever wanted to rewind time and maybe change a, a decision that we've made and kind of go back and try to right some wrongs. In this game, it allows you to do this with the narrative, except the changes that you go back and make aren't always for the best. In some ways, they hurt the people we're trying to save and the people that we love. Or games like That Dragon Cancer, where you get to play the family whose son is diagnosed with terminal cancer at the age of one, dies at the age of four, and you get to experience their story and the hopelessness and hopefulness, the loss and, the, and basically regaining faith as they went through this experience in their life. The designers of this game, this is their story. And they said they created this game because they want the world to mourn with them. In this game, you play a guy named Henry. You're kind of a knucklehead and you manage to meet the love of your life early on and for some godforsaken reason she married you. I know what that's like. And um, she is diagnosed with early onset dementia in her 20s. Not being able to help her, not being able to care for her, and not being able to save her. Henry retreats into the wilderness to become a fire watcher, literally puts himself in a burning forest. Metaphor, anyone? Um, and through this story, finds his way back out of the wilderness, back to his wife, and finds peace within himself. Papers, please. Where you play the role of an immigration agent at the border in an East, a fictitious Eastern Bloc country, and your decisions will decide who gets to enter, who's turned away, who is detained, who is ultimately left to die, and you make these choices under a regime with increasing um, penalties for you if you choose your moral path versus the law. Or games like The Last of Us, which is a little hard to see here. Um, but this is a game set in a familiar post-apocalyptic sort of experience, right? It's um, a rogue virus has basically covered the planet now and um, people are cannibalistic zombies and you have to survive in this world. And the very beginning of the game, your daughter dies in your arms. Unable to save her, joining 
um, this resistance, you are then presented later in, in life with another girl roughly the same age as your daughter. And you have to make the decisions that affect whether or not she um, lives or dies. She is basically carrying the antidote for the virus that saves humanity. And through this game, you have to make those choices. And this is a game that was um, heralded and, and lauded for its incredible deep storytelling, deep emotion, and putting people in uncomfortable places. Video games, each one of them, are an encapsulated universe. They sit behind glass. We can affect them, we can participate in them, we can project our own morals into them, but we, to date, can't be in them. Video games are different than any other form of art ever at our disposal because they're an amalgam of all forms of art. Illustration, composition, narration, orchestration, sculpture, all combined to create something greater. It, there are three voices in these games. The voice of the author, the mechanics, the voice of the game, and you, the voice of you. And combined to create a platform for empathy, for understanding um, situations and environments and stories we may never have to place ourselves in. And they do it in still such a rudimentary form, only 45 years young. And as I said at the beginning, we always knew that computers and video games meant more than the simple graphics and the simple machines of the dawn of games. And so I close with this. We are finding that a computer can be more than just a processor of data. It is a communications medium, an interactive tool that can bring people's thoughts and feelings closer together, perhaps closer than ever before. And while 50 years from now, its creation may need, seem no more important than the advent of motion pictures or television, there is a chance it will mean something more, something along the lines of a universal language of ideas and emotions, something like a smile. Thank you all so much.